Welcome back to the Spin Cycle Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz, joined today by Johnny Long, Kit Nicholson, Dane Cash. Today on the show, fake criteriums. Astana's doing weird Astana things. Chris Froome is never leaving. And a Mount Rushmore of Cav wins. Let's get into it. John O. Dano, kiddo. How y'all doing? <laughs> kiddo, sounds like you're talking to a kid. <laughs> you started. I thought that was off mic. Yeah, good. How is everyone? Yeah, great. Hanging out? Loving life. I'm sticky. You're sticky? <laughs> okay, you need to provide context, Kit. I just spilled orange juice everywhere about three minutes before I was meant to be on this recording. Is that because you had just celebrated emphatically Mark Cavendish's last professional bike race victory. <laughs> yeah, th- three days late. Oh, sorry, check, squeak. <laughs> well, so should we talk about that? Okay, we've kind of just taken over from you pronouncing all of our names and run with the podcast, but it's the off-season, <laughs> there are no rules. Um... <laughs> there are no rules. Yes, I want to talk about... I want to talk about these end of season criterions. We talked a little bit about Saitama before, and Johnny, you you've been to some of these. We had... Another one over the weekend, this sort of round of ASO, uh, which is obviously the Tour de France organizer, does all these criteriums in Asia. The pros kind of do this circuit. They get paid for it. It's kind of a mix of uh, there are some real races that happen in this sort of sequence, but most of them are scripted. And we had the last one over the weekend, which also happened to be, quote unquote, Mark Cavendish's final race. It was really more of Mark Cavendish's final kitted up group ride. I don't know how else you would sort of describe <laughs> describe this thing. He won. Uh he won over what was it Jasper Philipson? One. I'm putting one in, in air quotes. Jasper Philipson and Anna Dunn. In air quotes. It's just a it's a it's a strange thing. The whole thing is strange. And then we sort of get all these very earnest headlines off the back of it, like Mark Cavendish wins final race kind of nonsense. And it is not true. From non It's just outlets. straight up not it's not it's not true. It's not true. So what do we think about this? What's ridiculous about it, what, what makes it particularly ridiculous at least, is what is how the riders talk about it in the immediate aftermath. So, for instance, <laughs> Cav's uh, very detailed interview about the tactics and how he was realising in the last 15 kilometres that it was the last 15 kilometres of his career. Uh. And then it was the last time he'd go under the Flamme Rouge and that he was on the limit. <laughs> partly I mean, really he might hot, have been on the limit. November. <laughs> he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. Well, I don't think but, he's been riding but, much. <laughs> no, I don't think he has either. And and yeah, it's it's all very kind of quaint. I think. Can I read out the the PA Media copy that was published yeah. in the Guardian? So PA Media is just uh, like a newswire. So they'll just send out the filed journalism from something for people who like outlets who pay for it to put out there. Um, and is usually covered by someone who actually knows like the sport, right? It, or, you know, it's not just like some random national newspaper journalist who doesn't really know. So I want to read to you guys this article. So let's begin. Mark Cavendish signs off with emotional win in final race as pro cyclist. Then the two bullet points. British rider delivers victory in Singapore criterium. Mark Cavendish, pull quote, I couldn't have wished for a better send off than here. The article begins. Mark Cavendish claimed victory in his final race as a professional cyclist. The 39-year-old produced a trademark sprint finish to cross the line first in the Tour de France Prudential Singapore Criterium. I'm not going to go no. on. I could, I could, <laughs> I could bring the quote marks about how he says, um, "I'm so proud to win the Tour de France Prudential Criterium as my last professional race," and unpack. Oh yeah, that was beautiful, Schilling. Yeah. Um, how he says, you know, he had to try and follow Jasper Philipson when he went. It's just, look, we all enjoy these real fake criteriums. They're kind of fun. They're good at spreading the word about the Tour de France and letting fans in the side of the world see like all the stars. But don't take us for fools and <laughs> don't over, don't overdo it. Okay. Well, it's just, it's just not true. It is not a professional no. race. It was not his it's last not, professional race. It's not. <laughs> It was the last race of his professional career. Yes. He is still a professional cyclist, but yeah, to call it... It a wasn't a race, race is, though. Is, I mean, it wasn't even a race. A race. Is it, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's right. Well, even, with it, even, if it's, even if it's scripted, maybe it's still a race. It's just a scripted race. I don't know. We could get into semantic debate, well, yeah, but you, I like the... There's a great photo of the post-up, uh, the finish line, and you can actually see 
Jasper Philipson. He's not smiling, but he is giving a thumbs up <laughs> as he crosses the line, which says all of you need to know. Well, okay, okay, okay. Hot take, which I think I I think I hot took this already. It, I think in the middle of the Tour de France, I hot took this this hot take. Did it not look a heck of a lot like? Cavs last win at the Tour de France. <laughs> You're supposed to save <laughs> this for After Dark for <laughs> the spicy takes. Let's oh, save this. Okay. Save this for After Dark. Okay, we'll we'll save that particular that's a little, hot take. That's a little treat for. I'm just saying, Jasper Philipson had a hand off the bar as he's like putting his hand over toward Mark Cavendish. Anyway, we'll save them. You got to take after that dark. hat off and put your tinfoil hat on for that. Take, yeah. <laughs> he also looked behind him, like fully behind him, 180 degree turning his head like twice in the yeah, sprint, yeah. which last time I checked, not a good idea. I don't know. No. It is interesting to me that even in 2024, there is still this uh, kayfabe, I guess is the term. I mean, that's what it's called in wrestling. A what? Kayfabe in wrestling is the- Here we go. <laughs> is the maintenance of the idea that it is all real, okay? Right. Okay. So you don't break kayfabe, all right? You-, you... What does it stand for? I'm sorry, what, does what kayfabe K- like K- dash- K-A-Y-F-A-B-E. <laughs> okay. Yep. I'm sure a very ah. small percentage of our listeners- are you know all about this this is literally a word i've never heard and the rest of them are either like you guys who've never heard of it or you're like me who just read about it you know on wikipedia one day okay so even in wrestling though they do break kayfabe if like something happened like if someone gets injured li- really injured like in the ring or you know in, if someone's giving like an emotional speech as they uh as they retire or something like that mm. th- again this is what i've read that that they will sometimes let everyone in on the fact that it's not real. But mm. in in the cycling world, I don't feel like we like that doesn't happen. They they are fully committed. Like Cav <laughs> was fully committed to this lie. And therefore the person who wrote this story has no idea that this is fake. And mm. the ASO likes Surely to they do. Keep up this I, I don't know. The person who wrote the story might not just might not have enough knowledge of the sport, right? I mean yeah. if you don't know cycling, you're not gonna know this is fake. The thing is the way that Mark Cavendish participated in this criterion and acted afterwards and the way he spoke was like someone had won a competition to be Mark Cavendish for the day. Like you get to, you get to like do a sprint against his rivals at the 2024 Tour de France. You get to give the, the post-race interview, you get to stand on the podium without actually having done the, done the material bits to actually do that. So it's quite, it's quite odd. And it's a weird, and when he says he can't have wished for a better send off, if he'd done, if the Champs Elysees had been at the tour for stage 21 this year, that's a better send off, yep. whether you win yep. or lose. So maybe that's why he chose the Tour de France Prudential criterion. But also the Tour of Britain, like uh, someone pointed out that he was there and he got an award on a podium at the end of one of the stages. Just race it, just ride it. Like imagine, like clearly this whole Singapore thing has been part of closing the chapter, like going through the motions of, you know, finally retiring. He would have got adulation for like eight days in a row from various getting a big old check for showing parts up. Of, yeah, I'm sure you know Tour of Britain. They got money again now from Lloyd's Bank. They could have got him I there. Mean, would I have got way more coverage. Singa- the Singapore, I mean, Singapore. Criterium is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, the fact that like there is a Japan Cup, right? Like Japan has a real race, and then there's also the Saitama, and they happen. You mentioned this earlier. They happen in relatively short yeah. succession. But clearly, you can have a race and get big names over there, and yet. For some reason that we just decide it's better to do the fake one. Can I disagree with myself and go (laughs) off brand a little bit here? Because my my you know the my general Cav brand is is not to um fawn. (laughs) I think it's I think that's that's accurate. This is kind of nice, right? Like we we laugh at the fact that they pretend it's a professional race. We laugh at the fact that that the PA (laughs) wrote it like it was an actual bike race. You know there are other entities within cycling media that wrote about this like he had actually won a bike race, right? fine that that's all silly and and we can we can laugh at that but at the same time we've got a rider who is the greatest at all time at his thing right Mm -hmm. like if he wants to go and just get applauded and get to stick his hands in the air one more time and have everyone take a picture and everyone tell him how great he great he is like that's yeah seems like he kind of feels like he deserves that it's it's the biggest, most expensive retirement party you've ever seen. But there were actually two other retirees who I felt really bad for. <laughs> who were they? Um, y- y- Yukiro, uh, Yukiro Arashiro. Oh, yeah. And, who is Japanese. Uh, Thomas de Ghent. Oh. Mm. And Thomas uh, de Ghent, yeah. too. And, you, and so usually when, when somebody retires in an actual bike race and they do that somewhat kind of wedding-ish 
uh, parting of the mm-hmm. bike wheels. Um, uh, you get everyone who's retiring coming down it, and you just see Thomas again, Ikiya Arashiro. I mean. Yeah, they're just there, they, and they didn't get to enjoy the. Yeah. the well, Thomas again got in the breakaway in inverted right. commas, um, mm. and and got a trip to the podium. But yeah, it, it was just like somebody had said, "No, no, no, this is Mark's day. You can't come." If only DeGent had just stayed out there and won from the break. That yes, would awesome, he should have. You know? He definitely should have. <laughs> I the, feel like um, Thomas Degant probably knows it's not a professional bike race and doesn't think that that was his last his last bike race. Like he probably thinks yeah. that his last bike race right. was, was something else. Race. He just yeah. wanted a holiday. Yeah. The yeah. to counter your point, Kaylee, I I agree that he's like earned the right to kind of do whatever he wants, but it just feels a bit Cristiano Ronaldo going to the Saudi Pro League. You're sort of chasing yeah. the final embers of your athletic might and trying to recreate the feeling you once had. And uh, I don't know, just doesn't doesn't feel a fitting end to a very storied career. Yeah, I mean the 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 best end. Let's be like the best end would have been climbing off and never getting on a bike again after he won that stage at the Tour de Suisse. Yes, yeah, mm. that's what he should have done. Yeah, I mean it is at least fitting that the history books will show that his yeah. last pro race was likely the Tour de does not yeah. have yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> the yeah yeah. Exactly. The Singapore criterion because it's not a bike race. It's not a race. No UCI points. Yeah, yeah. Thomas no, against last bike race, by the way, Perry Shoney came in 59th. Love it. Uh, on on him. September 22nd. If the Singapore criterion had been a real bike race, there would have been commissaires there who would have also seen Cav <laughs> deviate in his sprint. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. You can't have it always. <laughs> All right. I think we need to move on from Cav and to his team his last team so we don't spend that much time talking about astana on this podcast but maybe we should spend more because frankly there's just always something interesting going on over at that squad uh so the 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 news this week we have some douse at watching who wants to wants to explain what's going on here yeah i could i could take this one because there's news and then there's the context and the context is pretty interesting The, the news is that uh alex dowsett is going to work for astana this is reported initially by uh, Dan Benson. He's going to be their uh, aero whiz, I guess, is the, is the point here. He's going to take his, his aero knowledge. He's, of course, a time trial specialist, or was when he was, a, when he was a pro. Time trial specialist, former hour record holder, and Asana is bringing him on to, one assumes, uh, get their riders a bit more aero, shave off some, some drag as they try to <laughs> get those UCI points next year. Which Are you convinced by this? I don't think it's a bad idea. It seems like a fine idea. I'm convinced by this. I'm convinced. I'm I'm, I'm going to play Ronan here for a second, which is like, this is probably beyond maybe sort of like coach and nutritionist. This is probably the next most important person in Mm. these teams these days. Like teams that have a good kind of performance engineer, performance director are much better teams than the teams that don't. Because this is now a sport of marginal gains, where if you are not eking out absolutely everything out of your equipment, and everything else that you're doing, you're just leaving speed on the table, basically. And so for a team that is almost certainly going to get relegated, right? We've talked about a little bit about those numbers before. If they're trying to pull themselves back up, I think this is a great move. And and Alex Dowsett, part of the reason, I mean, Ronan and I interviewed him for a performance process a while ago. It was like eight months ago or something now. And he talks about how he had a advantage early on in his time trial career in that he paid attention to this stuff before other people did. And then once everybody else caught up physiologically, he couldn't necessarily compete. So what he's going to go try to do at Astana now is kind of do the same thing again, like get, get a step ahead, get those riders a bit of a performance advantage. Like I said, we, we kind of laugh about it being Astana, but I, I, I genuinely think it's a, it's a, it's a cool yeah. thing for him to do. And it's a really cool career pathway for a rider like that to go take that step into that kind of, that kind of role. Yeah, I mean, the decision to bring him on is a good one, and it's something that you would imagine is going to help. The The reason that I provided such sarcasm with my context is that uh, if Alex Dowsett were to provide his expertise to me, I'm still not going to win any bike races. <laughs> and I don't know that the Astana roster right now is going to win many more bike races than I will. I say this because they really didn't in 2024. They were the worst performing World Tour team. And more than, je- more, more than just 2024, across the last two years, 
they're so far down the rankings right now that, okay, so the relegation cycle is ending next year. So end of next season, we're going to look at all the, the points scored by the World Tour teams over the past three years, uh, and, and also the non-World Tour teams, and those in the top 18 get to, get to be World Tour after that. And Astana can, next year, they can win all three Grand Tours, and if the other, perform, or the other low performers perform just the same as they did this year, and, and Asana does everything else the same they did this year, they can win all three Grand Tours and still get relegated. That's how far back they <laughs> Even if they win the Damn. Tour, the Vuelta, the Giro, they're not going to get their ticket. Does it matter, tour. though? Well, that's the, I think yeah, it I mean, does matter. You keep hearing about Arkea. I think it does or, matter. Well, it, it might Lotto. matter unless, unless another team Lotto haven't breaks. seemed to care that much, have they? Well, that's... Oh, well, that's a, an interesting one, but I think Astana is a Kazakh res- registered exactly. team. They're not going to get a wild card, whereas Lotto mm. Destiny, uh, they're always going to be they're always going to draw attention. They also get points, which Astana has still got to get points if they want to be invited to races. Do they want to be invited to races? I think they want to be invited to the Tour de France, <laughs> and I don't know that yeah, Astana is getting invited true. to the Tour yeah. de France. Do they want to be invited no. yeah. to races? <laughs> <laughs> that's but, true. So they, guess how many riders? Uh, Astana has in the top 100 on their 2025 roster. They're currently in the top 100 uh, UCI points on their 2025 roster. Oh yeah, I'd guess one plus or minus one. I, it could be could even be zero. I don't, how many is it? I'm trying to think of more than five Astana riders. This shouldn't be. I, I'm trying not to be too rude. So one They're of losing about half. One of them, of them yeah. they they picked up in the middle of the season. Oh, Betil. so they have two. I forgot. They have who's Lisi gone there. and Betil. One, one and a half. Yeah. <laughs> Ulysses and Betty all are the I mean, only two it, that are on that. I mean, the Astana uh-huh. stuff is also ridiculous. That when I saw that Dowsett and Kenyuk, Pete, Pete Kenyuk is also joining the team as a DS. Is he? When I saw that headline, yeah, he is. Jeez. Um, um, I, th- I half expected the, the the subtitle to be coming out of retirement because it would, <laughs> yeah. it, and it wouldn't surprise no, me. No, that's if it was Israel. Pre- <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. But it, it's it's like. I mean, if you look at the incoming and out, outgoing riders, they must have the, the biggest turnover than anyone this year. It's a proper revolving door. They're seeing, you know, but we haven't had the renewals yet. There are a bunch of Kazakh riders who probably will be renewed and they're just leaving it late. But they're bringing in 12 riders as it stands, 12 brand new riders, including Wout Poles, Diego Ulysses, Sergio Higita, Fasim Esnada, Champusan. There's, there's, there are some good, good riders yeah. in there, but yeah, like, like Dane has said... I, it's also none of them are really time trialists. Mm. So, uh, like you said, Dane, Dallas is great, but yeah, but that stuff matters everywhere. Twenty seventh yeah. and twenty third. It does. So they're not talking just time trial, time trial points. No, you know? I know. Like yeah. It's, yeah. It's everywhere. The good thing for Dowsett is he already had to suffer through a few years at Movistar, which is maybe the one team that can give a star a run for its money in sort of chaos vibes. So yep. if Dowsett managed to survive Movistar. Who I've actually heard some really like crazy things about, and I need to somehow figure out how to look into them. But not things I can say on on the podcast, but just like <laughs> mind so boggling well. shit. Um, <laughs> so I think he's going to be good. I I think it almost is tantamount to uh, you know how some teams are sort of doing greenwashing. I think Astana are doing Dowsett washing because he's like a he's like a regular nice bloke. He's got a, a British accent, which helps in sort of uh, you know believability and. I don't know. Legitimateness. <laughs> That's true in the US. Is that true elsewhere? Like in the US, I feel like if you hear that if you hear that accent, you're like, oh yeah, that person is making a lot of sense. Yeah, but is that true elsewhere in the world? I wonder. I just I like that's just that's the only thing we've got left to hold on to, so I'm just pretending it applies to everywhere. Um so no, I think it's gonna be fun. It's definitely gonna be interesting to watch. But they might be fine. They might they might just be able to stick around in the world tour because other teams fall. I didn't know that Pete Kenyuk was had joined i'd missed that yeah that was that was something that i that that was something that uh, well ned bolting has been telling his audiences that pete kennick is going to astana on his on his tour but it, the news has been broken today because trinity are closing for, for are whatever they? reason kennick well that probably is the death knell yeah. um crikey they really like their uh, apparently astana has come to like the uh, british influence inside their inside their team british and manx and, and you know well i mean all when was the last time astana won a a Tour de France criteria in Asia. That's Ask true. Well, that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the, the sort of Anglophone uh, revival at Astana is interesting. Cause, <laughs> yeah, they've cause, got like, Renshaw as well. Yeah, because Renshaw's, Renshaw's <laughs> still there. And, uh, and and interestingly, I'm just looking at the at the website right now. So they've, you know, if you go to the sort of the, the team page, right, there's a, there's a management page and a staff page. 
uh, Renshaw has been has been upgraded to the management page, Ooh, which whoa. means that he gets to wear a suit in his official nice. team photo, and the staff <laughs> the staff do not. The staff have to wear polo shirts. So that's that's the differentiator there. So that's, that's a that's a big upgrade though. And if you, if they got Renshaw moving up the ladder at Astana Management, you've yeah. got Pete Kennick showing up. You've got Alex Dowsett showing up. It's certainly a shift from uh, what it has been in the yeah. last couple of years. Like it sort of is Cav going to end up with a job at Astana? Do you <laughs> think? That, uh, I mean, he said you? that he wants one. Like not necessarily at Astana, yeah. but in general. That's, yeah. Oh yeah, he definitely stayed. I'm still something. not totally convinced he's retiring, and no. I told Kit this. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I forgot. I forgot to send this over before for Kit's rewatch thing over the weekend. But so that first the the rewatch that, that that Kit did over the weekend, which for anybody who missed it, you should go read it. It's a it's a look kind of an in depth look at Cavs' first win, and we're going to do these rewatches a, a, a bunch over the off season. Anyway, that finish first was the was in Chateau Roux, right, which was the location mm-hmm. of his first Tour de France victory in 2008. Guess where we go back to in the Tour de France this year? I think this is a very good point. And and there was a lot of talk about the return to Chateauroux in 2021, which is where Cav took, I think, his second of four stages in his comeback tour. But does he even know? (laughs) because <laughs> cyclists do, don't really know no but no, that's a what, good I mean, point. what I mean is that you know the finishing town oh, okay fine if you ask cyclists while they're on yeah. the race where are we they're like oh, yeah France yeah but he would he um, would know where he no, won I, yeah I realise that with Cav it's just like it's I thought you meant does he even journalist. yeah does know it, what like, it is. has he paid enough attention to what the next route is to even know that yet <laughs> yeah. someone's gonna tell him in April and he's gonna be like oh I should have started training earlier that's a bummer no, I think he probably knew that he was retiring after the tour, but Singapore Criterium, and it's why he didn't set, because last weekend at the Saitama Criterium, he said, no, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about uh, next well, year. Yet. I'm, I'm not, okay. I, I wonder if Singapore, if, if ASO said, okay, we just want you to announce your retirement at your retirement party, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and he's just been holidaying since then. And I think, I don't think he was ever going to come well, back. Well, he won't talk, he also refused to talk to reporters in Singapore about what he's got planned next. It's just like... Like he just wouldn't say any, like just wouldn't say anything, which is just weird. Um, He's just just on the on, on the Mark Wrench. Do you reckon Mark Wrench got the promotion based on Cav winning that stage? And do you think if you work for Astana, your bonus is like you just get one big mineral and you just have like <laughs> a cupboard in your house and you just open it up and then just like a giant sort of crystal just rolls out, like shaped in as Vino's head. That's what I like to imagine. <laughs> oh wow! So. I mean, they're quite dashing little suits here. They they have a cre- they have an Astana crest on them. Uh, I can't say that I recognize pretty much anybody else in this management list other than Alexander Vinokurov. They're not people that we interact with on a on a real regular basis. Well, maybe that's on um, us. Maybe that's a failing. We we just yeah. need to go seek them out. You know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I you mean, some of them are old more, riders. Kelly. We've got old riders like Dmitry Fufanov and stuff like that. Like I recognize him, but. Yeah. Also, it's all in English except for the the subtitle under Mark Renshaw's name, which is in Cyrillic. Yeah, because his anyway. real his real <laughs> title is Supreme Leader. <laughs> anyway, I think okay, we enough enough on Astana. They're doing weird things, but best of luck to Alex Dowsett over there. Well, I think with I think the, it's a good with thing. the new bikes as well next year. Yeah, with the new the, bikes next the, year. The mega Chinese money coming in. It's yep. gonna be good. Good story. Yeah. I think it's time to take a quick break. When we come back, the Koppenberg Cross beer thrower is being taken to court. Welcome back, everybody. Like I said, the Koppenberg Cross beer thrower is being taken to court. Well, I think the most interesting part about this story is that (laughs) it involves the Koppenberg Cross beer thrower, (laughs) which just sounds to me like... uh, (laughs) <laughs> a Sherlock Holmes story that didn't make the cut. <laughs> I, I think Agreed. it didn't make the cut because he he was caught on camera doing it. So like it didn't really require the investigative genius. <laughs> no, but Sherlock Dane, Holmes. I think because it, there's always a little bit of subterfuge in a Sherlock Holmes story, isn't there? So he probably you maybe. know in this imaginary version of events he might have an right. accomplice, or, or, yeah, yeah. or maybe who, he was, I don't know, went and stomped on Elizabeth's bikes or something. Maybe he was framed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It wasn't actually him. Yeah. Good pun. Is. Good pun, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the bike frame. frame. Yeah. 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 Frame. Yeah. Bike frame. Stomping. 
Thanks for joining <laughs> us, Dane. <laughs> I just, um, uh, it wasn't, you know, I just, I, I just met Johnny, just met effort. Yeah, and fair, I feel like our listeners deserve <laughs> the best only. So I, I just want to make sure that, that we're giving them that. <laughs> I almost shot coffee out my nose when Kit said the Sherlock Holmes thing. So we're on, we're on a roll in this, <laughs> this particular segment. Well, if you'd like the actual story. Yeah. Yes, please. I mean, it's not particularly, it's pretty much covered by the sentence that Kaylee delivered it with. But um, yeah, apparently it is a bit told uh, media on Sunday uh, or Saturday, whichever day the bike race was, that um, there have now been five complaints taken out against this dude, the, the Coddenberg Cross beer thrower, um, like, which is slightly perplexing. I'm not sure where they all come from. Five previous incidents, you mean? Like five other things that people have... No, well, it's like a question. Well, he just got his, ma- he just got his just... mates to also Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm wondering, is it... Yeah. Hmm. But a lot of people are, um, are displeased with this guy, apparently. And and is a bit, is a bit, has got a lawyer involved. So, because uh, it's... It, cannot this sort of thing cannot happen again which is fair enough but it will it also feels it feels like he should uh, he's kind of really leaning into his villain arc uh this this cyclocross campaign he lies a bit you know he's yeah he's yeah. Sta- he's stamped on the bike yeah he shouldn't get beer chucked in his face but you could also just let bygones be bygones a little bit like he still came second or the place he was supposed yeah. to come anyway i feel like both you and um, kaylee have now essentially advocated for assaulting riders uh, in the past two or three weeks here. So I, <laughs> no, I just... Not, is getting beer thrown on you assault? I, I don't I'm know. Not, let's let's let the not, court decide after Eli and his, and his lawyer take this, this guy to court. We're just saying it's kind of like we're a... We're advocating for it. We're just... It's a, it's a, it's a part of cyclocross. Like I said, you, you, the law, you, yeah. you built a course in a muddy field yeah. that basically just wiggles... And gave the spectators beer That just, that just wiggles it, around a kegger. Yeah. And then you are surprised... Yeah. Belgium beer, beer ends too. up it's, in your it's face. It's even better. Well, that's the other, maybe if I, I don't. Had... I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's not surprising in yeah. any way, and that you know it's part of this whole ecosystem. Like, like I, yeah. I know Abby pushed back on this last week, but you know these riders are getting start money. That start money is coming from somewhere. It's coming from sponsors and yeah, beer sales. Duvel. <laughs> so <laughs> it's sort of a whole thing, right? Like, yes, don't throw beer. It's, throwing beer is bad. To making it a whole thing when you get a small amount of beer thrown at you seems like a lot to me. It's a full glass. I don't know. Yeah. He was probably already wet. <laughs> <laughs> it could be refreshing. Do you think um, Sherlock Holmes, would his employment would have been radically reduced by the advent of like ring doorbell cameras oh, yeah. and sort of internet Cameras sleeping? in general being everywhere, I think he'd be out of a job. Yeah. 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 Well, unless he's, he's very good at, uh, at disguises. The deduction, yeah, but then he's like, "Oh, I can tell you, you went on holiday because you've got a tan mark on like this side of your face." It's like, yeah, look at my Instagram. Check their Instagram, yeah. mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, on our yeah. news list here, Chris Room is never going away. So basically, he's announced that he doesn't know when he's going to retire. Right? Is that right? Well, he's his contract with his Repermitech runs out at the end of next year. And I'll be honest, when his original massive contract was announced. Because it was five years, wasn't it? Mm. I remember there being some sort of clause in it that it wasn't necessarily a psych- a, a rider's right. contract a fully all the way through to the end. So I'm actually a little bit surprised that he's still riding. I mean, everyone is. Mm. Um, but he's now decided, he's now saying, you know, if somebody else wants me to carry on, if, if there's a team who wants me, I, I quite fancy it. Um, so maybe Astana uh, 2026? Yes, let's make it happen. <laughs> Especially if they don't make the, like if they get relegated then having a former tour winner on their roster could be helpful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or <laughs> yep. to, to sell the Chinese bikes, he'd be a good person to do it. Yeah. Totally. He's, he's great. sold he's... more quad locks than almost anybody. I thought he's great at marketing. Well, and then, didn't they get bought? Did they not get bought quad locks? So that's what I'm just looking yeah, at. That's the tech news yeah. from me. That's what I'm just looking at. Yeah, they, they, were, they were bought by Tuli. Tuli. Yep. acquired quad lock. Oh, the so this is people. He, talking about uh, <gasps> ROI on a Chris Froome sponsorship. How, guess how much? Guess how much Tuli acquired Quadlock for? I know this one because I just wrote the story, uh, so I'm going to sit this one out. Half a half a billion. Whoa, Johnny! Not that far off. I saw. I saw the story too. No. Oh, did I get it wrong? Well, so so five hundred million Aussie, which is three hundred twenty-seven million American. Well, Johnny didn't specify okay. currency, so I feel like he that's gets true. an A plus. Neither did yeah, I. Yeah, Neither yeah. Did I. I always default to. Yeah, so that's a lot. That's a lot of phone case holder things do you sold. think they're now gonna make the the roof boxes fit on the top of your car like a quad lock <laughs> like gary barlow's son just lifts up the roof box and puts it on the uh, oh, on the car of, 
bit of zeitgeist for you. There you go. <laughs> Dane and Kaylee just looking blankly at what, what yeah. Gary Barlow's son is. <laughs> What's the Google say? I'll show you later. It's great. I, you know what's my one of my favorite things with, with these acquisitions is reading the quotes from the various CEOs and things. Like, did you know that it is striking how similar our brands and cultures are? Said Andrew Poole, huh. Quad wow. CEO. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, like, striking. Sounds, it sure. sounds kind of like AI yeah. to me. <laughs> it is absolutely striking. We should mention, we should mention after dark, this episode. <laughs> we gotta change what it is on a regular basis. This episode, it's gonna be the hottest takes about the same topics we yes. already talked about. So, yeah. for example, I kind of messed uh, it up earlier. I, I messed it up earlier. I, I gave my my calf. I, I hinted at my calf. But it's take. a taste of what of what we. But we have more about. hot takes on all these topics, and we're going to be getting into them in after yeah. dark. So we're gonna we're gonna just continue on here. This one, okay, slightly. Uh, let's bring the tone down a little bit, more, yeah. more serious, because this is horrible. So massive, massive flooding in Valencia, in Spain. Um, I was actually just chatting this morning with uh, one of our frequent contributors and somebody you were working with, Johnny, and this Ineos piece that's coming out this week. Um, Chris Marshall Bell, who lives in that part of the world, he spent the last couple of weeks cleaning up, uh, helping clean up. Uh, yeah, just just an awful, awful disaster. Uh, I think a couple hundred people lost their lives. And there is a cycling connection here because there's quite a bit of racing down there. Yes. What is it? The Comunitat Al Valenciana. Yeah, I always get I always get confused of the exact order of the words. Um, so that's a stage race that usually happens first second week of February. They're supposed to announce their route around this time, but they've had to they pushed it back, and there are sort of questions of whether the race is going to go ahead or not because ninety five percent of their materials, so like promotional stuff, I guess barriers, God knows how many different things you need to actually put a bike race on have been lost to the flooding covered in the mud and water because it was all stored in a warehouse that was hit by the flooding. Um, so just d- devastation, really. That's quite hard to comprehend. The race director also um, said that some his, of the start towns, the expected start towns, the ones that they had planned to reveal, uh, yeah. are you know, severely impacted by the flooding as well. Yeah. So it's... um. You know, an aside to an important story that sort of pales in significance, but I guess when you're trying to rebuild after these things happen, when February comes around and that thing doesn't, maybe doesn't happen, then it will be a reminder of, of what did happen before and how everything's changed forever. Um, so not great, unfortunately. That's the, the, that's the thing with bike racing is it's so interwoven into the real world and, you know, society and things that go on that everything's affected all the time. Indeed. Yeah, so yeah. keep an eye on that. Read, read Chris's piece yeah. uh, on Cycling Weekly. Sorry, uh, just to add, he wrote a piece about how I think there've been a few, like a lot of cars have been banned from roads or routes as they tried as the, like emergency service vehicles had to have access to them. So a lot of people jumped on bikes to help with the cleanup effort, uh, and it's a really good story. So go and go- give it a Google and look at it. Chris included. Read it. Yeah, like I said, he's been he's been getting his hands dirty for the last couple of weeks. Uh, all right, last on our news list here. Dane, you talked to Luca Grechelena this week, who's the the GM over at Little Trek. Little Trek? Little? 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 Little. Little. Okay. Little Trek. <laughs> uh, Luca's also coming back from a couple years away from the sport and some, some health issues. And so it's really good to see him sort of back in the paddock, so to speak. And like literally actually back in the paddock, he came back to the tour this year and got to, got to say hi. Uh, you spoke to him about a whole bunch of things, but specifically we wanted to talk, I guess, like sort of cyclocross adjacent here. So Thibaut Nice, it's one of those names that is said about four different ways. We're going to go with Thibaut Nice here on this podcast. Uh, I think we said it differently last week. Anyway. Yeah, until we're told differently. Yep. He's been winning a whole bunch this fall. He's also looking pretty good for a road career and dane you talked to luca about sort of what the plans are there and this is one of the sort of i think most exciting young new riders we're talking in the last couple weeks a whole bunch about like okay who's gonna who are gonna be the riders that sort of dethrone the current the current superstars and i think that nice is a pretty good bet to give that a shot yeah i mean obviously there's dethroning tari pogacar is no mean feat but in terms of, I don't think he's going to do that. But he yeah, could be. He could, maybe, be a, he could be a Wout von Art two I think that's that's like the that. hope is that is yeah. that he becomes that next person to make that jump. And he already has. He's already had a lot of success even at a young age. So he's 
uh, 22 as of today. Happy birthday, Tebow. Uh, and it's recording on, on, on Tuesday here. And he has already won what that, five World Tour races. He won a bunch of World Tour stages across the whole calendar this year. So he was, first of all, he was already capable of beating World Tour talent. Second of all, he's already capable of, even at a relatively young age, having success across the calendar and being able to be consistent throughout the year. Great in the cyclocross season last year, great throughout the whole season, great again this cyclocross campaign. And that's not an easy thing to do for a young rider, to have that longevity throughout the whole season. So there's a lot of reason to, to be really optimistic about him. That has nothing to do with the fact that his father is a legend, so we know he's got the pedigree, uh, which another another way in which he is similar to a cyclocross star, our turned rose Yeah, maybe star. Vanderpool 2.0 is a better analogy. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. with this, the the hope is that he will become. And this is from from what I, you know, he said and what what Luca told me. I think the hope is that in relatively short order, because he's already good enough, you know, we're gonna see him racing and and potentially contending uh, in some of the punchier classics. Uh, and the goal uh, is is for next year for him to do a Grand Tour, and uh, he's also hoping to do the the Ardennes races. I think that's the other goal is for him to go to the Ardennes. Uh, one really interesting thing that, that Luke and I talked about is, and this is not just uh, applicable to, to Thibaut Nis, but also just in general for young riders, is the way in which the current state of the sport, where 22 and 23-year-olds are suddenly able to be winning the biggest races in the world, when five, 10 years ago, we kind of talked about the late 20s as being a rider prime. The way that that framework has really changed the game for rider development. Yeah, Luca was saying that, first of all, you get a lot of young riders who now want to immediately jump in to the world tour, where in the past, you know, they, they would ride with the Devo team for a little while. And that experience, being a, on a Devo team, is a great way for you to learn the ropes without as much risk of burnout. Uh, and I think that is a major concern for teams now, uh, trying to bring riders you know, on to the, the top level so early is that they might burn out. Uh, and, and that whole framework is, is a really interesting way that, um, that Lidl Trek and, and other teams in their, in their position have to balance, like winning now, bringing these riders up to speed quickly so that, you know, they don't languish, but also, you know, balancing that with the fact that you don't want to bring them up too quickly. Uh, it seemed like uh, uh, Thibaut in particular uh, has a really good understanding of where he is i think it probably helps that he's been you know, a known commodity okay, because of who his father is and because of how good he was so young for quite a while um so it seems like he is coming along at just the right pace but yeah there there is this sense that when you're trying to find the next pogaccio or the next vanderpool which every team is trying to do right now because those single riders are so important right now there is that risk of bringing them on too early having them burn out uh, but then the other side of the coin, there's other risk that they won't want to join your team if you don't if you don't tell them, hey, we're going to send you you know to World Tour races right away. Uh, I wonder if we're going to see a bunch of riders re retire before 30. I, I think it's a real possibility for that yeah. reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, like I, I've always sort of uh, sort of had a pet theory that you could you could kind of race at that level, even if you're not at the World Tour level. You, anybody, even amateurs, you could kind of race at the like level at which you peak you, you top out so whether it doesn't matter to me whether that's a cat three or a or a, or a world tour pro for about 10 years because it takes so much kind of energy and effort and caring <laughs> that at some point you just run out of maybe lack of a better term fucks to give and you just like you cannot do it anymore <laughs> i feel like that's true across sport too i mean i can think so, of a lot of athletes in like baseball for instance who when they're 21 they seem like they're gonna break all the records and they stay yeah. really good for like you said about 10 years yeah, but then there just comes a point where it's like, okay, they're thirty. You wouldn't think physically it's time for them to just call it, but then they mm -hmm. go into rapid decline or they retire because they've been around long enough that even though they're still relatively young, thirty is relatively young, right? I hope. Um, yep. And yet, it, you know, it's just too long, too long doing the grind. There are lots of exceptions, obviously. You got, you got, you got the Valverdes out there. You know, Oscar uh, Sevilla just won a race this week. Oscar uh, Sevilla just won a race. Uh, yeah. Did he? Yeah, like, but they're, but they're they're really the exceptions that prove the rule because most of the time you don't see that, and it is a it's a low impact sport. A lot more riders could ride into that that yeah. sort of age, and they don't. 
because it's, it's I think I feel like it's mostly a mental thing. Like a lot of them are not necessarily declining that rapidly physically, but yeah, it's like um, it's like how quarterbacks can go on for a long time because you're not punishing your your body in the same way. But and like you see it in um, proper football soccer where Wayne Rooney was playing from the age of like 16 where usually you take a while to develop and you gradually do it but he was so good he just got thrown in but then by 30 years old he's done like your knees are just gone like your body like the idea like all these people all the like riders who are super fit and skinny it's not like it's not they're not living healthily for the most part like you're you're running your body on like in a high high gear low gear but with like loads of revs right you just it's not how it's not how you're supposed to live yeah that's why I tell myself anyway. <laughs> to, to bring it back to Nice and, and what they're trying to do with him, I think the goal for this coming year, and the, the, something that Luca was talking about, is trying to pick a grand tour. They're going to look at the roots. They're going to try to pick a grand tour. They feel like he has a chance to win something. Um, well, and, well I, I think that's the... Half the ride is... He's, he's going against half the field here. Probably the obvious there, one right? from the from the field perspective. <laughs> but I think they're also looking... They're most looking at the roots. Uh, they're going to try to find some punchy finishes, uh, and and well, might be some of the Vuelta. And there might be at the Vuelta, but like let's say they're at the tour. Every, wouldn't every you rather race get now has punchy finishes? Wouldn't you rather yeah. get? Yeah. So that there, the question is, you know, can he win something? What's you know, what's the level of the victory? I would imagine is also a, a consideration. But yeah, so it's not just like they're going to send him. And again, this is I think a change. In the past, you have a rider making their Grand Tour debut. Just send him to the tw- to the race. He'll get the twenty one days of experience in his legs. Now there's a little bit of additional math to the equation. Send him to a race where he can actually maybe win something because that would do a mm-hmm. lot for his his confidence. His, his you know at this early point in his career. And I don't know that we would have seen that you know five ten years ago. Twenty two isn't even that young, right? right? Like yeah. I, I feel like yeah. tw- twenty two for a first Grand Tour <laughs> is actually is actually. Even by old standards, not that unusual. I think it was more more often yeah. we saw twenty three, twenty four, but twenty like it's only a year. I, you know, I'm glad that they're taking their time, and I know I, I've spoken on the same topic with Luca previously, probably ten years ago now, and I know his perspective on it. And I know how careful he is with young riders, and that's probably a big part of the reason why Nice has not done a Grand Tour already. And and I would I would imagine his his dad has some opinions about youth development i <laughs> think just that's probably true as well anyway dane there's gonna be a story up this week right i hate saying that because then it's like oh man i gotta do it but gotta yeah run yeah, it yeah yeah gotta write we've done it with Ineos for about a month now, <laughs> and it's fine. So go check out the story that is up hopefully this week last on my list here we're gonna we're gonna do another another mount rushmore segment hmm. we talked a lot about cav early in the show so I think it'd be fun to put aside our skepticism of Mr. Cavendish uh, and and just talk about some good things because, you know, he's done. He's officially, officially, officially maybe done. Don't believe it, but we'll see. In theory, he's done. So let's do a little Mount Rushmore of Cav victories. We've got we've got four spots to fill here. And 165 shoes. 165. So we're going any, any Cav like victory. Any Cav victory. And I can give you no. right now mine. Go on. The 2009 Milan San Remo finish. Yeah. yeah. Which uh, it's like the it's the obvious one for anybody who does not recall. Uh, this was one of the last times that a sort of full on bunch sprint came to the line on the Via Roma uh, at, at Milan San Remo, and it looked for all the world like the breakaway was going to make it. And Cav shot out of that peloton and basically passed them, I think, 30, 40 meters to go, if that, and took his first monument victory. So that that one for me. And that this is a year after his first Tour de France win. So we're sort of entering peak Cav at this point. I would say that 09 to like, what, 11 or 12, that was kind of peak Cav era. Any other uh, proposals? Yeah, well, I mean, I've been looking at... Uh options for rewatches and I, I but one that stood out to me of the cav collection of which there are many lots of people there are a lot well there, obviously there are lots of cav wins to choose from but i chose this well i'm choosing this one because i actually remember watching it and there i i came to cycling later than cav started winning um so i'm going for the 2013 tour de france stage 13 the crosswinds into saint amand montrond so stage 13 he and about a dozen others 
including Peter Sagan, broke away from the peloton in the crosswinds. Um, there was a little kind of tiny little ski jump, 10k from the finish, but um, they got they went all the way. Cav had two teammates in there with him. Um, as did Sagan, you should list but, off who uh, was in that breakaway move yeah. because it's a very strange breakaway move. <laughs> it is. It's, it's bizarre. Is this the free um, one? No, not a free no, one. No, that was that was later. Yep. Um, this, so it's in order of finishing: Cav, Sagan, Bakun Molima, Jakob Fulzang, <laughs> Nikki Terpstra, who was somehow beaten by those two, um, Roman Kruziger, Alberto Contador, Lawrence Tendam, Sylvain Chavanel. And then Michael Rogers, Nico Roach, Daniela Bernati. So there was a lot of Tinkoff riders in that break. That is quite a cast. Um, yeah. And Bodnar was in there with Sagan too. So the Tinkoff riders were all riding for um, Contador, for Contador, uh, Contador, obviously. Yeah. So Contador, yeah. was, Contador ended up getting about 45 seconds, if I re- remember correctly, on that, on that stage. The, um, oh, it was about a minute on the rest yeah. of the field. It was 11 years ago, so. I apologize for the error. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> no, I, I, I distinctly remember that day because it was this very strange, much like the Froome one a little bit later, it's this really strange breakaway where you're like, it, it is not often where you see Mark mm. Cavendish flicking an elbow and Alberto Contador comes through. Yeah. Like That is not something that happens very often. So I like I like that as a pick kit. I like that a lot. And it's it's exactly the sort of, it's an exemplary Tour de France sprint stage when they've obviously really want there to be some excitement in the middle week you know it's it's in the dead zone stage 13 it's a weekday um so yeah it's it's a perfect tour de france sprint stage all right we need two more uh, for me i am partial to the 2021 comeback win the first one when it had been five years since it's cavendish good shout. had done much i mean since he'd won a tour stage but more than that i mean it had been quite a while since cavendish had been anywhere near the cavendish of old uh, he bounced around a little bit. It it was yeah. Th- things were I, as somebody who prior you know prior to this stage, uh, I I'm sir sure, I'm sure I wrote a preview and I'm pretty sure I didn't give Cav a whole lot of love. Uh, and then he went on and won a bunch of stages that tour. And all of a sudden it was wow, Cav might break this record. Cav's back. And yeah, he did that in Fougere. It was stage four of the 21, 2021 tour. Uh, Fougere with the lovely, lovely little Breton town with a great medieval castle. It's just a great setting for for this uh, emotional. Can we talk about any town? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Where did and, he, and Where did he win? Where did he win two days later? Chateau. Chateau. Ooh, yeah, that's right. I'm telling yeah. you, he's coming back this summer. Uh, he's coming back this summer. <laughs> he nope. he can't say no to a Chateau Rue. He cannot say no. Good good pick, Dane. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick two. And I'm I'm gonna invoke right. article whatever of my of the sh- of the great chapeau rights of 2024. <laughs> um, I was tempted by 2011 Skelder Price. Ooh, no, I wa- no, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> Nobody. The Bradley Wiggins leading him out on Ooh. in the World Champs bands on the Champs Elysees is an obvious one, and the, I think that was one of the first. She said the tracking shot, which was like ah, it- one of the first times I was watching cycling. I was like, this is. The good. first tracking shot was actually a Cav victory, but it was the Renshaw lead out. Oh, it was the other one. Yeah, uh, it was the early. It was like okay. a, a 2000, well, maybe first on 2011. The well, no, actually, no, it was it was 2011. So it was no, it was the year before Wiggins. Was Wiggins yeah. was 12. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Well, the first one I remembered anyway. Um, or the number 35 one with the dead fox. With the <laughs> it was just like a perfect the dead fox sort was of Cav. Good. The dead fox was good. <laughs> Search that on Escape Clax if you haven't read that, but that was that was great fun. Where there's just a dead smashed fox right outside the the standard bus, and all the team staff were jumping up and down celebrating further smashing the dead fox. <laughs> um, it was also is that a, metaphor? Uh, is that a metaphor for anything. Uh, I think I probably made some overall metaphors. In is the a fox is a fox kind of a remember. metaphor for like the British the Garbage. British Empire? That's a metaphor for Astana's time in the World Tour. <laughs> and to to get this win, they killed the fox and further deadened it. The uh, there was also the the personal irony or familial irony of this in that my dad has watched and worked on all of Mark Cavendish's Tour de France victories. He works in TV graphics, but for number thirty five, he'd worked the previous day's Tour de France stage. He then went straight into working overnight because it was the UK general election uh, that day. So went straight from one shift into another one, 
got through to like 10 a.m finished that shift and then was like right you know what i'm actually can't do 24 hours or whatever of work in one go so sub someone else in to cover that shift for him and then cavendish obviously won number 35 so he was waiting for that number 35 and then slept alas all the way through it <laughs> Brilliant. um which is fun uh but yeah i mean that for a mount rushmore of victories especially sort of iconic ones or ones that have such nuance and narrative to them mark cavendish for a sprinter as well mm-hmm. actually comes out with quite a, a quartet or quintet he 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 was never boring we give him that he was never boring no yeah and that, i i would say it's better to be even if sometimes people think things of you i think it's way it's a way bigger crime to be boring than not nice but maybe that says more about me than than people <laughs> i think that's the journalist in you talking johnny you it, he does give yeah. us lots of stories to write yep he's yeah he's a complex character all right we're gonna wrap up for today when we come back our guesses as to what cav is going to do next year plus hot takes from the rest of the show and how would you improve fake criteriums and how would you improve fake criteriums I've got some notes, surprisingly. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. This is the end of the free version of this podcast. If you want to get After Dark, head to escapecollective.com slash members or just hit the homepage and hit join, whatever you want to do. Once you're signed up, you get all the info on how to get into the members-only podcast. And with that, we'll see you next week or in about 15 seconds. 